collaboration with Purdue University. We're really glad you could join us. Um, today's topic is the impacts of naloxone access laws on opioid overdose deaths in the United States. Um, so uh, I think it'll be a very interesting um, and, and I think perhaps even controversial um, topic for us to consider. Um, the presenter is Elam Erfinian, and her co-authors are Alan Collins and Daniel Grossman at West Virginia University. Elam is a PhD candidate in natural resource economics at West Virginia University. She's also a, a graduate si assistant at the Regional Research Institute. She will soon join the Community and Economic Development Initiative in Kentucky as a postdoctoral scholar. Her research interests lie in the fields of health economics, energy economics, urban and regional economics, and natural resource economics. Her focus on the, uh, is, is right now her focus is on the opioid crisis and how public health policies impact and are impacted by regional economies, rural development, water, energy generation, and health outcomes. So with that introduction, again, um, thank you all for joining us. I'm going to pass it on to LM. And um, Alam, thank you very much for joining us, and we're looking forward to um, learning about your work. Alam, you'll have to unmute your mm -hmm. microphone. Okay. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mark, uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, the topic that I'm talking about today is the impact of naloxone and access law on opioid overdose deaths in the U.S. And as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Collins and Daniel Grossman are my co-author, and I'm talking today on behalf of um, my co-authors, too. I also wanted to say one other thing before you start, and, and that is for the participants, I just would like to remind you all that if you do have a question, you can type it into the chat box and it'll appear and um, Ellen will have a chance to answer those questions at the end during our discussion time or if she happens to see them um, ahead of time and wants to answer them, she may do that as well. So please feel free to um, offer questions or comments. Thanks. Okay, we are all familiar, familiar with the opioid epidemic in the U.S. Opioid ep epidemic is the leading cause of unintentional deaths in the U.S. And on average, every single day, we'll lose 130 person uh, in the U.S. On the left-hand side, you can see the daily doses of opioid consumption in top 20 populated country in the world and unfortunately the US is the is far ahead of any other country in the world that in terms of uh, daily doses of opioid, opioid we are consuming much more than any other country on the right hand side you can see uh, another figure that the, is one of the most recent figures published by CDC three different uh, layers uh, that started with prescription drug uh, abuse and then shifted to illicit drug abuse and recently after 2013 more focus on uh, synthetic drugs like fentanyl A slide. Uh, I keep 1999 um, county drug overdose deaths per 100,000 rate. Uh, also, 2014. This is the last, uh, the most updated year of the data in county level that I had a map out of it, and we are working on uh, having the newest version of 2017 deaths per. 100,000 related to opioid overdose. Uh, the most important concept of comparing these two maps are how far we are different than 1999. We can see 
the deaths per 100,000 is really increasing over time. I will talk about other aspects of this map later. All uh, the previous slide talked about how opioid uh, issue is a really problematic issue in the US. But the good and the good news is that opioid overdose is reversible. We can um, stop the death by um, some drugs like naloxone that I will talk about it more. And somehow with changing the law, it would be easier for prescribers, pres uh, dispensers, or um, good Samaritan people to help uh, users and save their lives. One part of the story about opioid crisis is how we control the supply side. For example, with programs like prescription drug monitoring programs that try to check the medication history of the users, we can control the supply side. That's one part of the story. But another part of the story is how we can save lives through some medic medication like naloxone that I talked about it before, and I will talk about it later more. From 1996, an increasing number of programs have provided naloxone to opioid users. What is exactly naloxone? Naloxone is a prescription medicine can reverse the overdose. And people cannot overdose after using naloxone. So it's not harmful. It's not threatening for opioid users. It's just one medication can save lives. There are different forms of naloxone in the market with different prices. Yeah. Number one is the nasal spray one. It needs some kind of assembly, so it's not that much easy to uh, work with it. The second one is Narcan nasal spray. We heard of it probably more, and it's much easier to use it, more expensive. And the most expensive one is FZO auto injector that you can see in the third picture. Um, it's really expensive but it's much easier to be injected for the user. And the fourth one is the common syringe type of naloxone. So what we know, naloxone is available through different administration parts. What about naloxone access law? The first state to implement the law was New Mexico that started implementation of it in 2001. Still, after many years, there are Wyoming and Kansas that they don't have any naloxone access law. After this introduction, we want to ask the question, are naloxone access laws helping to reduce opioid overdose deaths? What exactly we found was depends on the provision, the law may or may not help reduce the opioid overdose death. So some provisions of the law are working, some provisions are not working to reduce the opioid overdose death. Actually, I'm not aware, uh, I, I can see the question, so I read that, do you know why Wyoming and Kansas don't have those laws? I'm not aware of the reason. But let's uh, go ahead and talk about what exactly in the locks and access law um, do laws do, do in terms of controlling or impacting the this. Okay, depends on the provision, the law may or may not help reduce the opioid overdose deaths. We will talk about it more. And what interesting aspect of the law that we found as a result was not only the law can have impact on within the state uh, opioid overdose deaths. It can affect surrounding states overdose death rate too. So this is somehow new to the literature. It makes sense in terms of 
cross border movement of naloxone or drugs not stopped at the border. So whatever we are doing in one specific state can have influence on other states, usually neighboring states too. We will talk about it more. Okay. One new aspect that we looked at it in this paper uh, was paying attention to how naloxone access law is not homogeneous. It's not consistent in all the states. It could be different. For example, some states, they have uh, third party authorization, means that as a user, uh, prescribers can prescribe naloxone to my family if I'm the user. Those family members or my significant other acting like a third party and without even them using the drug, they can have naloxone in case I overdose, they can inject it to me. So some states, they made that law uh, to make naloxone more accessible. Some states, the second part, some states make... Um, administering naloxone be immune from civil or, or criminal liability. In some states, that's the case. In some states, it's not. In some states, uh, possession of naloxone is immune from criminal liability. In other states, it's not the case. The fourth one, in some states, a standing order is authorized by pharmacists, by firefighters, by nurses. They don't have um, patient-specific prescription. They can prescribe naloxone to a patient in emergency situation. That's the case in some states. In some states, it's not the case. Or the last one, immunity from criminal persecution, civil liability, or professional sanction. In some states, these three different provisions, each and every of them or all of them, is the case for um, prescribers or it's the case for dispensers. Some states they don't have it, some states they have it. So there are different provisions of the law. By controlling as a binary variable that a state has the law or not, we miss different provisions of the law. It could be the case some of those provisions are helping, some others they are not helping to reduce the, the opioid overdose death. By controlling those provisions, we try to make it more accurate to see the results. Uh, Tonya asked about if I have more specific information about Indiana. I will check it out and let you know for sure. Tanya, if you'll leave your email, she can um, respond to you and provide that information. As an example, in this slide, you can see two specific provisions of um, the locks and access law. For example, immunity from criminal prosecution for prescribers for prescribing, dispensing, or distributing the locks. It's not the law in Michigan State, but the civil liability and immunity from it is the law in Michigan State. So you can see two very similar provisions of one specific law have two different aspects in one specific state. And in our research, we control for that. Uh, another part of our contribution, what was the motivation behind the consider uh, a spillover effect or indirect effect or out of a state effect. They are all the same in terms of if we have a policy in our state, that specific policy can have impact on our neighboring states. As you can see, I highlighted Appalachian region because there are more than one state that they suffer from high opioid overdose death rate. 
there are another clusters in the United States as well. But that's the beginning of the story why we need to look at opioid overdose as a regional problem. It's not a local problem. It's more specifically about a region. Of course, looking at the map is the first step, but we need more uh, statistical analysis too. I used a um, common modern eye index that measure if we have clustering in one specific variable. For my case, the variable was uh, opioid overdose death rate. So in 1999, the first year of our analysis, and in 2016, the last year of our analysis, both years, they had clustering in terms of opioid overdose deaths. When we are dealing with clustering, where we are dealing with the regional uh, impact, we need to go with um, in uh, with a model to be able to capture those regional effects. So these two steps was the primary reason we use a spatial model. I just keep the formula here in case any of the audience have any question, I will talk about it more. But the most important part is that our dependent variable is a set of different form uh, uh, is total overdose death rate in a 100,000 population. Our naloxone is a set of different forms to control it. I, I will talk about it more. So, and we control for other dependent variables as well. For example, we control for income inequality index. We control for unemployment rate. We control for education level. We control for poverty rate. Also, insured rate, uh, uninsured rate. We control for population density. We control for heroin-related crime and drug prescriptions. These two specific uh, variables try to capture the supply side effect. Uh, we didn't have information about what's the supply in terms of illicit drugs in each state, but we had. Uh, heroin-related crimes, it's some kind of proxy to control for supply side of the illicit drugs in one specific state. And drug prescription is controlling for what, how much is the supply of prescription drugs in one specific state. With employment ratio, uh, we, capture, we want to capture the effect of high-risk injury kind of um, occupations. We control for um, manufacturing, construction, and mining because they usually there could be the case people start using prescription drug and then they end up shifting to using illicit drugs and use uh, be um, drug users. Uh, we control for different years from 1999 to 2016. We have 48 continuous states plus DC. Uh, we control for state fixed effects and year fixed effects. In terms of state fixed effects, there are sometimes uh, some specific uh, cases for states that uh, we cannot capture it with a panel analysis like what? For example, uh, it was important for us to see if those states that they have boundary with Mexico, they are suffering from higher opioid overdoses. Because it's uh, not changing over time, like Texas, we control it by a state fixed effect. Or with year fixed effect, there are some occasions like introducing fentanyl. It's almost the same it happened at the same year for all the states. We cannot control it in our uh, model, but we know our year fixed effect uh, captured the effect of those occasions. I talked about it a little. What we did, it was some kind of robustness check to see uh, if we change from a 
simple binary variable to control for naloxon access law. What can happen to the effect? For example, for the first case, our variable of interest, the naloxon access law, is a dummy variable. Those states with that specific year, if they pass the law, we consider one for them. If they don't, we consider zero. It's a binary variable. For the second estimation, what we did, we count the days after law enactment. So it's cumulative days of um, the states passed the law. And the third option is a breakdown of access law by their specific provisions. I talked about the provisions before. And so some states have a specific provisions. We control for those specific provisions in our main model that is the third one. Um, Susan asked about do we have a breakdown by race? We didn't, but the good news is that uh, this study was a state level analysis. We have access right now to the county level data. With that one, we are working on another study to expand so many variables. That, that is one of our plan and thanks to reminding me that. Okay. Uh, by the third model, uh, I mean we control for different provisions. Naloxone 1 is having a naloxone access law. That is model 1. Model 2 is days after law, and model 3 is naloxone 2, naloxone 3, naloxone 4, naloxone 5, and naloxone 6. This slide is a summary of our results. I just um, consider naloxone access law variable and divided it by two parts, impacts within the states and impacts on neighboring states. Those five different provisions can cat categorize in two different categories, one accessibility and one liability. Provisions three and four are more related to accessibility, means that by those specific laws, naloxone is more accessible. By those liability ones, we, we are focusing on uh, providing immunity from liability. So there are somehow different. So there are two most important categories. Those naloxone access laws that provide accessibility, they are helping to reduce opioid overdose death rate within the state and in surrounding the state. Those naloxone access law, they are more related to liability, they are not helping to reduce the overdose death rate in a specific state and within the states. And no matter how we control for the law, if it's a binary variable, if it's just days after passing the law or with different provisions, still the indirect effect, that is the impact on neighboring states, is there. And it's most of the time all the time consistent with the same sign for within the state effect. What we found, of course, opioid overdose death rate is a regional epidemic, is not a local phenomenon. The naloxone access law has impact on opioid overdose deaths. And we found some evidence of a spillover effect of the law enactment. By a spillover effect, I mean if we pass the law in one specific state, surrounding states can benefit or suffer from the result of that too. Of course, to deal with a regional phenomena, we need to work together. It's not all about 
one specific state try to find and resolve the problem and as long as other surrounding states are suffering from the same issue we will have the impact of those surrounding states on our specific state so we are in contact with other states whatever we are doing in one our our specific state it can influence on surrounding states too Uh, okay, Mark asked another question about would you please explain what is mean by NELAX and liability? Of course, I will talk about it. Let me come here. Uh, NELAX and two immunity from criminal liability, civil liability, or professional sanctions for prescribers or dispensers. By naloxon liability, I mean this specific provision. This specific provision, actually, it's six different provisions. We aggregate all of them in one specific provision for any kind of liability for prescribers and dispensers. Plus, for naloxon 5, you can see immunity from criminal and civil liability for administering naloxon. By liability, naloxon liability, I mean naloxon 2, and naloxone 5 that they are uh, and naloxone 6 because it's related to criminal liability for possession of naloxone naloxone 2 naloxone 5 and naloxone 6 they are all related to naloxone liability provisions and naloxone 3 and 4 they are related to accessibility they make it easier to have access to naloxone but naloxone 2 Five and six, they are helping to immune liability for prescribers, dispensers, and those people that administer the naloxone. So just to clarify, Elam, what you're saying is, is that, that your, your estimates are saying that if you have greater immunity so that you're not liable if somebody dies and you're trying to help them, that there are more, it, the, the, the statistics reveal there are more fatalities with that kind of law? Yes, exactly. That's right, Mark. Uh, I, we will discuss more about it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, we, uh, we really are not interested to see the result of such a law that is contradicted what with what we expect to see we want to see if we make it easier for prescribers or dispensers to prescribe and dispense naloxone we expect to see it's helping to reduce the opioid overdose death it, it seems it's not and I, st I will start talking about it. There are some possible explanations. First of all, even if we have the law, maybe naloxone is not enough in terms of supply side. This is one of the problems. Even if pr providers, they know they are immune from liability, still they don't have enough access to naloxone to provide to uh, drug users. That's the assumption based on if the law is clear, if there is law. What if law is not that much clear in terms of uh, giving the immunity or other aspect of the law? Maybe the state implement the law, but prescribers, dispensers, those people that administer uh, naloxone or third party or standing orders they are not aware how clear is the law the third part that is the most important thing is that naloxone as a drug that can reverse overdose will decrease the consumption cost what i exactly mean by decrease the consumption cost is moral hazard issue we see we saw that before 
that sometimes that's the case. People uh, start changing their behavior with knowing that as a user, if I have naloxone on my pocket, I know in case I overdose by using more potent or more illicit drugs or more drugs, there is a chance somebody can save me. It could have some kind of effect that we call that moral hazard means that I will be more careless as a user to use more potent drugs or more drugs. Then at the end, I, I will overdose again. Or uh, another story about naloxone access law is that, of course, naloxone as a medication that can reverse overdose, it's helping to save lives. But it's not helping to decrease and reduce overdose. We call that unintended consequences. Because as long as we are not working on the rest of the cycle, Users need recovery. Users need treatment. With focusing only on prevention part, we are missing the other parts in terms of controlling opioid overdose. Uh, there are some limitations in the study. Okay, Tessa, I will talk about it more. Why moral hazard here? Uh, sometimes, like seatbelt, I think it's another example of moral hazard with the law <clears throat> that it's mandatory to have seatbelt when we are driving in the car. There was a shift in having more car accidents or more accident out of driving carelessly because sometimes people <clears throat> believe <coughs> excuse me with um, having seat belt I can drive faster I can drive not the same way that I did before more careless it's the same story here too by having naloxone I know my family members they keep naloxone at home I may end up using more drugs I may end up trying different combination of drugs. I may end up using more potent drugs like fentanyl because I know they can mm, save me. Sometimes those explanation make sense in some of the policies like seatbelt policy or in terms of naloxone access law. Uh, it makes sense because users may change their behavior. Exactly, Shishir, that's the case. Okay, we had at least two limitations for our study. The first one is that, as I mentioned it before, we have different types of naloxone in the market, one to four, and they have different prices. Uh, I checked the price that most recent one was uh, from 20 to 40 for one dose uh, to almost 2000 for EBSIO. That is really expensive. And there wasn't any way to control for that different prices and different types of naloxone in the States. So we are not capturing that effect. And second of all, naloxone access law is more recent law. So many of the states, 19 states specifically, uh, imposed the law in 2015 and 2016. Means we don't have enough post implementation, da implementation data to see the effect of the law after what's going on in that specific state. And 19 states is a lot when you're talking about 48 states plus one. What we have as our plan for future, that future is coming soon because right now 
uh, we have access to county level data that will enable us to do the county level analysis because in one specific state even if we pass the naloxone access law still counties act differently react differently one of the plans is applying a hierarchical analysis using county level data to control for a specific state and county and for now what we consider as a neighbor was contiguity weight matrix or those states that they have a common border it could be the case we need to uh, define it more uh, precisely in terms of if one specific state passed the law we need to differentiate between that state with a state that doesn't uh, impose the law as a neighbor it could be different when we are looking at the effect of passing the law on states when that neighbor passed the law or not we need to figure it out how to control for it but that's our future plan and of course whenever i'm talking about the impact of the naloxone access law on opioid overdose this uh, i received those comments that what about the process behind states implement the law how they decide what are those factors influencing the adoption of the law in one specific state it's another research research question and we will go through that in future works i will go with takeaway what's the most important thing from our research encouraging people to go through treatment activities it's not all about saving lives if we try to focus on prevention not focusing on treatment recovery and sustainability for these three parts we are missing um, so many things so it's really important at the same time we save lives to give the chance to to the users to be first of all alive and encourage them to enter to the treatment to enter to the recovery part and support them that's the most important thing and by saying that i'm uh, ready to welcome to the question and comment and thank you all thank you ellen um, for those in the uh, audience, if you'd like to add um, um, any comments or questions, and while we're waiting for those to come in, I, I had a question. I, I was wondering, you know, in terms of those states that have naloxone access laws versus those that don't, do the ones that do have them, are they the ones that tend to have the higher death rates, or are there any patterns that you've observed in terms of which states have adopted the laws and which states haven't? Uh, one of the concern, if I understand well, uh, one of the concern about maybe those states that suffer from higher opioid overdose deaths, they decide to implement the law. So endogeneity issue. We checked that it wasn't the case. For example, West Virginia, as one of those states that suffer from a high opioid overdose deaths for years, uh, we start implementing the law really recently so it's not the case that those states that they suffer from a higher rate of opioid overdose they think about implementation of the law mm -hmm. so there's a question thank you um there's a question from tanya uh, naloxone access laws have proved to create moral hazard or is it a concern that it could uh, uh, Actually, I, I'm more biased towards saying that it's a concern. It's, um, it's hard to talk about proving, but uh, Doliak and Mukherjee, they have a working paper that they talk about moral hazard in terms of Nelox and Access Law too. Uh, they are arguing that the crime um, and hospitalization is increasing 
and opioid overdose death is not decreasing after implementation of the law. And they argue that's moral hazard with the same explanation. It's changing behavior. But it's really um, hard to say that it's proving. Right. There's no one empirical study that is defining, but you look at different angles and aspects. And so there is a concern and there is some evidence that there may be moral hazard. Would that be fair? Exactly. I will go with it. <laughs> Robin has a question. Um, mm -hmm. For clarification, your study results showed that states with naloxone liability laws are greater, have greater overdose deaths. Yeah, unfortunately, yes, that's the case, Robin. So, what we found, no matter what the provision in terms of the liability part, liability, immunity from liability is not helping to reduce. It's more even the opposite sign. It's increasing the opioid overdose deaths. But the other side, more accessibility provisions, they are helping. If the third party, one of those accessibility parts is the third party authorization. For example, as a user, me, my family member have naloxone in their hand. I assume when family members significant others are involved, they care about the user more. So it could be the case they can connect the prevention to treatment and recovery more. So it, it can be seen as decreasing the opioid overdose death rate for more accessibility. Elham, do you see the comment from Sh Shishir. I'm reading that is there a chance that higher overdose states may implement the Luxon law? I'm not sure, Shishir. We test that. It wasn't the case. At least as an example, we have West Virginia that start implementation of the law in more recent year, years while they are suffering from a really high opioid overdose death rate for years. We have a, oh, a couple, another question. Great. Jen, I totally agree. I 100% support having access to Narcan, Narcan or any form of naloxone. The first step is keeping users alive. If they are alive, then we can do something. So the first step is having more access, easier access to Narcan or Naloxon. And then we need to focus on the rest of the process. What I really, this is the, actually, let me talk about it more. This is the first study that I did on opioid related uh, topics. And I'm still involving in more research, maybe three or four more. And day by day, I think about, I'm really happy that I start the research with the, the Naloxon Access Law. It opened a new window that I'm thinking about. First step is let them be alive as a user. Then we need to go further, to do further work on the rest of the cycle. They need to be treated. They need a lot of um, facilities for recovery part, but the first step is keeping them alive. And naloxone is doing that. So it's better to have more access, but it's not the end of the story. It's beginning of the story. Yes, I think we have time for uh, one or two more questions for those who are typing. Um, here's your chance to ask a follow-up question. You know, as we, um, you know, the group that we're putting together the webinar talked about this issue, we knew that, you know, it, it was important topic, but the whole issue of, um, you know, uh, moral hazard, um, 
the the chance that some people, if they know they can be saved by naloxone, will they engage in even riskier behavior was an important question. And we also, uh, you know, agree with Ellen's comment about how there's a continuum of policies and policy interactions that can help uh, reduce fatalities and substance uh, misuse. And so we need to think about them holistically. And so this is one part of the story that all of us felt was really important to sort of struggle with and think about. And so I really appreciate your, your work, Elon. Thank you for um, sharing it with us. Um, we do have a couple, what, one other question. Perhaps you could answer that one from PBS. Sure, sure. PBS, did you come across any states programs that provide support after administering naloxone? Uh, actually, one of my most recent work is on the impact of uh, treatment and facility, uh, recovery facilities on opioid overdoses. We are at the starting point of that. We need to collect and clean the data first. It's a lot of information there. And I'm personally, I'm really curious to see if they show they are helping and how. I want to see the most detailed work on what is different in terms of if one specific recovery program is helping to reduce the deaths, what's specifically about that program that is helping while the other ones they are not helping. It's a starting point of our another project. Hopefully I will be able to present it soon enough. And, uh, and, and finally, Jen has a question uh, or a comment about paradigm shift. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on her comment. Uh, when I start, actually, Jen, to present my first work that was the same topic maybe three years ago, uh, I uh, I didn't know how much is important to use uh, different terms like uh, drug user as a substitute for addict. Now I try hard to keep um, being careful how to use the word because as you mentioned it's a health crisis um, and that's right exactly. They need help, and it's not some kind of um, you know, fault that they are addicted. We need to work together to deal with that health crisis. Okay. Well, I see PBS has thanked you for your um, presentation and findings, and I thank you too. Thank you very much for taking time to share your research with us. Thanks sure. everyone for joining us as well on the webinar. We will record it and post it for others who um, may join in later on as well. Uh, and I forgot, sorry to say that, after this slide that you can see that I have my email address there, I put uh, more slides related to um, uh, different, yes, as you can see, First of all, the link to my article, the published version of it. Second of all, more information related to the provisions and the law, and more information related to the fundings. If you have any question regarding any of those slides, please let me know. Okay, and with that, I think we'll close off the, the webinar for day, today. Thank you again, Elam, and thanks to sure. the audience for joining us. Have a good afternoon. You too, thanks.